Where did I lose you guys? Hang on a minute. Okay. The layout button up in the top right hand corner. Um, Different views. Mm -hmm. And put on the gallery view, I guess. Okay. So, uh, thank you everybody to, for being here in our seminar series, in my seminar series. Uh, today we have uh, Kimberly Oren. She is a, a former high school science teacher, turning to a commercial fisher and co founder of Fishing for Success, a nonprofit a social enterprise in Petty Harbor that is creating a new pathway for the youth in Newfoundland and Labrador to connect with their fishing heritage. She volunteers on her town council. She leads, she is a lead facilitator. Uh, for the project Wet Canada, Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, and serves on advisory committees uh, for Food First Newfoundland, Ocean Frontier Institute, Governance Research, and the Canadian Ocean Literacy Co Coalition. Kimberly has an uh, honor to, to be recognized as 2018 St. John's YMCA woman of distinction for the girls who fish program. Uh, when not teaching uh, others about fishing, Kimberly is probably out picking berries and uh, with her dog, Annie. So uh, you see we have a very distinguished uh, uh, presenter today and let's hear. Hello and uh, welcome. I'm uh, really excited to see a lot of familiar names and faces here and some people from uh, time zones far away. Hello, Yinji. And um, so I'm going to try to share right now. And so this, uh, there you are. Uh, I'm going to try to share in a moment. But before I share, I want to encourage everybody to put uh, questions in the chat. Um, box for me and um, because I'm trying something different um, today as far as this presentation goes. I usually do sort of a, a fact-based thing about uh, gender and fisheries or youth and fisheries and this is um, a little bit different and then I'm kind of uh, going into kind of logic model, pedagogical, uh, tangly thing about why um, um, Kind of why I decided to do what I'm doing with Fishing for Success. So um, I, I really would appreciate your feedback and what you think about this. So let's see how you do with this sharing thing. So So do you see the slideshow now? Yes, we do. Yay, awesome, okay. So um, what I'd like to do uh, today is tie in um, three uh, large kind of knowledge areas, which is small scale fishing, climate change and ocean literacy. And it was funny, as soon as I posted the title on um, Twitter, um, one of our Girls Who Fish members um, had a, a concern about using small scale fishing as a tool. So I avoided putting that in the title, but you, you tell me if you think that it's a tool or not. Um, so this is where I started in a classroom as a high school science teacher. And you can see that um, it's um, what kind of learning happens here. I really had, I mean, I loved it. I was teaching chemistry and biology and I was happy as a bug in a rug talking about electron configurations and I could have taught that all day long. Um, but um, you look in the bottom corner and the kids are white and the boards are white and the walls are white and the light coming in is white. And I don't know what kind of learning really was sticking with my students. And, um, and, and one incident really stood out um, for me, and that was uh, in Florida. I was teaching in Florida, and at the time, the Florida Wildlife Commission was really encouraging teachers to teach about manatees because 
uh, manatee numbers were decreasing rapidly and collisions with uh, boats, uh, especially jet skis was on the increase. And they were asking teachers to talk about manatees in the classroom and to help with efforts in conservation. And so I decided to talk to my ninth graders about manatees. And um, I happened to be teaching at a country day school and the kids all had their own jet skis and lived on water canals and they were quite privileged. And so we um, read poems and wrote stories and and did um, role playing exercises, and uh, and and I still was getting questions like, "Well, what do you think they taste like? And <laughs> how would you hunt a manatee?" And you know, all of those are very valid questions, and I answered them. And we looked up how um, Native Americans who lived in Florida might have um, eaten manatees, and and we discussed that. But I I still was getting the idea that they were not in the least bit interested in slowing down their jet skis or staying out of the water during the season when the manatees were in those protected waterways. And um, so I decided to take them outside. And, and we know, but the research tells us that taking people outside for learning, experiential learning is most powerful. And so this is, I took them outside. We, you know, they were privileged kids, the parents could afford it, so I loaded them up, we went to Crystal River, they were on the boat, they were cold, they were miserable, they were motion sick on this little narrow river, and uh, when we dropped in the water, uh, the funny thing is, um, there was a, a line of floats and kayaks uh, filled with volunteers to keep um, the snorkelers away from the manatees, you have to wait for the manatees to come to you, and the amazing thing is that they do, they come to you. And um, and then when you when you float in the water and, you, and your ears are in the water, you can hear them squeaking and clicking to each other and communicating. And the, the mothers will bring the babies over to you, and they want you to scratch them under the under their their flippers, and they'll roll over so that you can scratch the the, the plants that are growing along their back off. And uh, so you get to interact. They come to you. It's really amazing. And when we got on the boat, the kids were just squealing and talking and, you know, they, it, it didn't matter anymore that they were motion sick. It didn't matter that they were cold or wet. Um, and uh, when we got to back to the classroom, their discussion about the manatees changed to how they you know, were interested in not riding their jet skis and they would talk to their parents about it and what could they do at home. Could they put up signs on their docks and uh, the whole discussion switched around because they had interacted one-on-one uh, -on -one with the manatees. And so then I continued um, throughout my, my time there at that school and developed um, you know, a deep sea fishing club, a scuba diving club. Um, and uh, so very soon afterwards, I quit teaching in the classroom and uh, went back to graduate school um, at the University of Florida to study aquatic sciences and fisheries. Um, University of Florida had it has a fishing for success program where they teach kids to fish and it was a good place for me to practice um, what I wanted to do because I was plotting to come back home to Newfoundland and teach kids to fish and all the while I was really thinking about um, this great big huge overwhelming um, tangly thing about what I was seeing with children in the classroom and this, some of this information at the very bottom here applies to children in Newfoundland and Labrador, but the top stuff is, is really general information about what our youth are facing today. And it's even compounded because of COVID now. And one of the things is, um, that started back in the early 2000s, um, it was TAG Nature Deficit Disorder by Richard Lou, and he started this um, um, First book was uh, Last Child in the Woods. And, um, and so, this idea that because we spend less and less time out in nature, especially children, UK studies said that children spend less than 15 minutes outside every day, which prisoners are here are guaranteed an hour because it's a human rights issue. Um, kids are experiencing increased um, mental and physical disorders, things like diabetes, heart conditions, obesity depression and um, and all of this is linked to not going out in nature. So Edward O. Wilson, um, the scientist who of course studied insects, he described things like biophobia, that children were actually afraid of um, living things. And I observed this um, 
when I was teaching because kids didn't want to touch um, the fish they were catching. And their parents, if their parents were there, their parents would say, don't touch that, it's dirty. And uh, kids were getting, of course, glued to those, those virtual screens. And the problem with a virtual screen is that you can access it from anywhere. It's placeless. And, um, and, and that classroom, that classroom was placeless. You saw those classrooms, they, that could have been taken anywhere. It could have been taken in New Zealand, in Newfoundland or Florida. It's, it's, it's placeless. And place is really important because it helps us uh, connect with our community and, and provides us with our identity. So all of these things um, concerned me about our, our students. I was just concerned I was teaching the wrong thing because a kid's not gonna learn chemistry if they don't have um, all of these other pieces of themselves first. And then there was just this huge tsunami that was coming at us. Of course, we didn't know about COVID then. This was back in the early 2000s. But all of these things about biodiversity collapse, climate change, recession, depression, or what was going on with the economy, all of these things we, we knew were on the way. And I was just um, overwhelmingly worried about this. And I was concerned about my grandchildren's future and what this meant and what kind of world we were leave, leave, leaving behind for them. And I just saw that or felt that our youth, our young people really are the key to this, um, that they needed to be engaged in this process. And if we were going to engage them in this process, they needed to be equipped. So where are we right now? So this decade of ocean science for sustainable development. We've got blue economy and blue development and all of these blue things going on. We're all out at the ocean. What does that mean for us? And then 2050, we're supposed to go to net zero. Big stuff, sustainable development goals, there's 17 of them. We're supposed to have those in line by 2030. All of these great big, huge, big, tangly problems. And so how are you gonna address these? Like just this huge tsunami of stuff coming at us. So I want you to think about why I was considering why fishing could be a piece of this. And, um, and, and why fishing, I felt, was so powerful in a young person's life that it really might have an impact. And not just in the child's life, but um, also that it could impact those three pieces, sort of these three legs on a stool, you know, climate change, um, small scale fishing, and ocean literacy, sort of these, this three legged stool. So, how many of you guys are on Twitter? You're putting things in the chat. You're on Twitter. <laughs> Let's we'll, we'll share Twitter handles or something. Um, so this is um, Natalie Panic. She is a um, aeronautical engineer, and she designs robots that go into space. And she got interested in science because she would go fishing as a youngster. So how are we gonna get kids interested in science? She didn't say anything about she got interested in science because she was in a classroom all day long listening to a teacher blabber on. So like today, I would take you out fishing if I could. That's really what I would do to get you excited about something like this. But think about why you are here. I mean, I know why I'm here. I'm here because I caught a first fish and it got me interested in science. And the cool thing is that I have a picture of my first fish and I have a letter about my first fish. And um, this letter about my first fish, when my grandfather passed away, um, you know, you're going through your loved one's things and um, on his nightstand next to his bed was his Bible. And in tucked into his Bible was this handwritten letter of mine that, you know, that he had kept from me for 45 years. And, um, and it really must have touched him enough that he put it there in his Bible and kept it there that long. 
And so what is it about these experiences that means something to all of us? And I mean, I know that it got me excited about science and directed my life forward to study science, but it also really was a powerful thing for my grandfather. Well, what does fishing mean to people who are involved in commercial fishing? So here's this EcoTrust Canada report. Um, this was over in um, the west coast of Canada, Vancouver, and they asked commercial fishermen about what fishing means to them. And so you think, all right, they're commercial fishermen, so it's got to be like money. Um, but when you look at the thickest line, it's not money, it's culture, it's intergenerational connections. So fishing isn't just an economic activity. So there, there's something else going on here. And so when we think about all of the different ways people fish throughout time, because people have fished since like people were people, it's not something new that just came up. Um, and so you look at all the different ways people fish, you look at this one here. Um, uh, of course, this is kind of a favorite of mine because this is a traditional one for Newfoundland and Labrador where a woman and her daughter collected for um, like gleaning at the shore to collect capelin, and then they were scattering it back home to dry it just out, out on the ground. Uh, one of the simplest ways to collect protein at the shore. But all of these different ways to fish. This is Leo, who um, I dare not call him our elder, so I'll call him our um, tradition bearer, say, for example. I tease him that he should try this technique right here, but I'll never tell him to do that. Um, but you can see that there's so many different methods, but every culture around the world has fished in some way. So this connects us. It's in our DNA. We all live by the ocean, a pond, a lake, a river, or a stream. Um, this is where we exist. We don't exist in those square box classrooms, painted white, windows too high to see out of. But yet this is most kids experience with fish now, you know, that square thing on the bun. Um, I've actually had children say to me when we go to take them out on a fishing trip, they'll actually turn and say, why are we going out here? Why don't we just go to the grocery store and get the fish? Because the grocery store is where food is made. It's actually made there at the grocery store. So combating that is part of getting kids to understand their place in nature. And that's important when we're talking about that three-legged stool, climate change, ocean literacy. So I quit grad school, bought some property in Newfoundland and decided to teach kids to fish. And so Fishing for Success was established in Petty Harbor. And this is our mission. And it's, yeah, so it's about teaching kids to fish, but it really is about building on that three-legged stool to start tackling the problem of um, uh, developing ocean literacy to start um, somehow picking away at tackling this big tangly problem of climate change and um, diverse ocean diversity loss or just biodiversity loss in general. And um, because kids don't understand their we don't, people, humans, adults, don't understand their place in nature unless they really get into it. You can't just sit in a classroom and, and learn about it. You've got to get in it. So why we chose Petty Harbor? Well, it's right in the center of the harbor. Here we are here. It's you know, community-centered. Um, when you're out here, you're in the middle of the community. You're very aware that people can see exactly what you're doing. It's just if you're on stage. Um, it's um, historically in the center of the community. It's literally considered a sacred place uh, to the elders in the community because they grew up there assaulting and making fish and learning how to cut out cod tongues. Here's a picture of it now at night. Location, location is very important. It's only 15 minutes away from downtown St. John. So you have this great target group of urbanized youth. You have newcomers coming in to Newfoundland and Labrador so that you can um, share culture and heritage with uh, newcomers. 
But most importantly, when you start thinking about um, large scale versus small scale and start picking apart that piece, um, this is um, my favorite um, wrap up. I mean, a, a diagram is worth a thousand words. And, and I know um, Dr. Paul used way more than a thousand words in the two um, papers that described this diagram. And so pulling these uh, comparisons apart of large scale versus small scale, and let's pull those apart. Oops. Okay. Um, if we look at small scale fishing, it emits less carbon than uh, large scale fishing does. So just to remind you about the difference between large scale and small scale fishing, small scale fishing is 15 meters or less. And so um, they maintained um, the amount of, um, when they were comparing the amount of fuel, they maintained the um, catch per ton. You can see the comparison here. So the catch per ton, you get more fish per fuel with small scale fishing. So if we think about, um, let's see, I don't know if I, I can't get that bigger. So you'll have, what I can do is I can, if you'll, I can make this um, available for you um, after the talk so you can look at this, but wild fish is right here in the middle. So this is um, carbon emitted by your food. And this wild fish is right here in the middle. Looking at um, food production, which one is more efficient, large scale versus small scale? Um, small scale, um, if we consider that we don't want to convert um, fish into fish meal or oils, we want to convert it into food, then um, small scale fishing doesn't do that. It can, um, it, and also the other thing, of course, we don't want to um, have discarded sea. So this is another way that small scale of fishing is very efficient. And the other thing is maximizing employment. If we're talking about small scale fishing is, and, and reducing poverty, it maximizes employment. So small scale fishing um, maximizes employment and uh, also maximizes food production when you compare it um, to, you know, across per ton of oil. So I've got to put that gender lens in there. And if you think, because you can't leave 50% of the population behind if you're dressing any of those um, legs on the stool. So when we're thinking about um, SDG 5 and all of those, uh, one of those 17, every single one of those other 16 SDG 5 could be a lens through which we view these. And if you look at, um, so gleaning, of course, is a, historically um, a woman, a female, a woman activity because you can bring your ch children along. And if we move through and look at small scale fishing, which means you're on a boat, you're less likely to see women. And then as you move through conference speaking, leadership roles, management, where policy is made, you see less women here. And that's um, really a shame because research tells us that women are more likely to follow the rules, more likely to be conservation minded. So um, targeting women um, and young girls to get involved in getting in the boat, getting in leadership position and serving as role models is very important. All right, so this is a lot on a slide. So this is like what you don't do in a PowerPoint presentation, but here it is anyway. So you can uh, check out this website, howwefish.ca. And I'm sure many of you have because I'm, I'm speaking to, to fisheries folks. And you can take a look and see that the least severe way to fish is a harpoon. And you can go diving and uh, follow your fish that you want with a spearfish. And I've done that, it's a lot of fun. Once you shoot the first spear, all the sharks show up because they want to take your fish from you. Um, and then you go up through and here you've got hook and line. And then all the way up here, you've got bottom gill net, which ground fish, codfish is a, a bottom fish. And then we've got bottom falls, which is the most severe. So you wanna be fishing in the green here. So small scale fisheries, tend to use gear that is more effort intensive 
that's what I was talking about with the maximizing employment. Um, more effort to fish means that you're maximizing um, your employment. They tend to fish down here, so that means it's less contact with the bottom. It's more selective, so that means you know less bycatch. It doesn't get set in the water. You're not leaving it overnight. And so why is this a good thing? Again, that's that um, increasing fish harvester employment, protecting the habitat, reducing bycatch, reducing ghost fishing, reducing microplastic waste, reducing marine mammal entanglement. All of these things right here are, are ways of targeting um, improving health of the ocean. So small scale fisheries and supporting small scale fisheries is a huge part of that um, supporting that stool, that three-legged stool, and, um, and and creating healthy oceans. And we know that healthy oceans, of course, well, oceans are a driver of, of climate. Healthy oceans are going to put us in the in the direction we want to go. But why worry about whales? Why do we care about a whale anyway? I mean, yeah, they're sure they're really cool to look at, um, but um, but they're really the earthworms of the sea. They help to, to move nutrients around. They, uh, they, they help to uh, provide new nutrients for plank phytoplankton, which of course is, provides like 50% of the oxygen um, of, the, uh, of the earth. And uh, they're described as replacing like one whale can replace uh, more than a thousand trees. So that's really huge. So we need whales. So we're entangling. Every time we entangle a whale, that's more than a thousand trees that we're taking out of a system. So the oceans, like four Amazon, the, the number of whales in the ocean is like four Amazon rainforests. One whale, thousands of trees. So we should care about whales. All right. So Fish remind us of our own place in nature. So why do we need to teach kids to fish? Um, people don't live on farms anymore. 80% uh, of, you know, just over 100 years ago, 80% of people lived on a farm or in Newfoundland and Labrador, they lived in a uh, fishing community or participated in a family fishery, but that's not true anymore. Most people now live in metropolitan areas and they don't have contact with how their food is made especially not with slaughtering processes. Fish feel pain. And yet, we, you know, we know that we've got research on it. And, um, and, and the really interesting thing about it is if you can reduce the stress and the pain that the fish feel um, quickly and kill them more humanely, uh, they release less stress hormones and um, the texture of the flesh is better and they taste better. So, I mean, it's really, a you know, a good thing for us and the quality of the product to do that quickly. And there's also this moral thing about doing that too. But so from thinking of it from that standpoint, a quick humane slaughter is the best way um, to handle your fish. And that's hook and line. Hook and line allows for you to handle an animal one at a time, quick humane slaughter. And that really helps us to understand where we are in this world. When you have to handle one fish at a time, you really understand um, what that fish has sacrificed for you to have a meal. And um, so how many times do people actually um, make a meal from start to finish? Do you, how many of you grow your own carrots and then make your own food from them? How, how many people grow their own cow and make their own meatloaf. We don't have that opportunity anymore. And so our children don't either. Most of the time, you know, what our children have access to is going through that drive through at McDonald's. That's their access to how they, how they do their food. One of the biggest things about trying to get kids to um, change how they behave towards that manatee was to have them develop empathy. And that's a tangly, thing to teach. So how do you teach empathy? And so it's one of those like dual 
thinking things about you want to teach empathy while you're teaching a child how to kill something quickly and humanely, but you know, it's teaching you your place in the world. Humans are predators. Um, sharks are important to uh, biodiversity of coral systems and um, and ocean systems. And so all of that um, ties in together to teach us our place in the world. So one thing that um, is an important here when I talk about this with um, when, we, when we communicate things, I don't call this fishery a recreational fishery. I never, I, I try not, I try to avoid saying recreational fishery. Unfortunately, when I'm talking to people from um, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, you're stuck in saying recreational ground fish fishery, but um, it's a food fishery because I don't want to teach children that it's a recreation to kill an animal because it's not. You're killing the animal for food and um, it's, it's something that you have to do. Children have time afterwards to reflect on, on the day and to um, place, you know, what's happened. Okay, so this, uh, these are the, um, the basic principles of ocean literacy. These were established in the early 2000s in the United States. The um, National Marine Educators Association worked on these. Um, I was teaching marine science at the time at that uh, country day school and had the opportunity to participate in this huge process at many of the conferences that the National Marine Educators Association held at the time. And so these um, have been moved forward uh, by the United Nations and various other countries around the world. Uh, Canada is now developing uh, their own standards by the uh, Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition, and uh, they're bringing forward and those are going to be introduced in March. So I'll uh, let everybody know if you follow us on Twitter and Facebook, I'll uh, send out invitation to that announcement. And if you notice all of these and work through these, you can see that um, if, we're, if we're asking people to, to act on climate change, they've got to have some background information first. If you're, if you're going to change your behavior about something, you have to have, uh, you have to know it. Um, and, and, and loving it would be even more effective. But you've got to know it first. And so, of course, I tell you that the wow factor is putting them in a boat, getting them on the ocean, teaching them to fish and feed themselves. And if you work through each of these seven principles of ocean literacy, you see that you can touch on each of these uh, by getting someone in a boat, fishing and feeding themselves. So I say that fishing, getting people out fishing and feeding themselves is like the quick and dirty method to teaching the principles of ocean literacy. So what we have to do now is we need to establish standards for ocean literacy for Canada. And so that's uh, in process. That's got to be included in pre-K through grade 12 formal education. We've got to have place-based programming that's culturally relevant and inclusive for that community. Because we have indigenous and non-indigenous communities. We have, uh, you, know, you travel through Newfoundland, there's very different cultures, even as you go from different communities within Newfoundland and Labrador. And so we have to be respectful of that. Um, and we've got to increase access to fishing as a human activity for food and mental physical well-being. We need to talk about things like a subsistence fishery. And uh, right now, the um, recreational ground fish fishery is uh, currently only available Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And it sounds pretty privileged to me because Saturdays and Sundays are, um, many people don't have those days off. I know we, we work with um, nonprofit organizations like the Association for New Canadians, uh, First Light, Choices for Youth, Thrive, and, um, and, and social workers don't work on the weekends generally and they don't have transportation available on the weekends. So it's really put a, a huge crunch on our programming. Young people are the key and it takes all of them to move all of these um, levers to start acting on climate change. And, um, and they've got to have all of this knowledge of ocean literacy uh, behind them in order to, um, to do this. And so that dory, launching that dory, it, it just can't be Leo and Marshall, 
but with a bunch of little ones helping out, they can get it all done. And the little guy in the back, I could still hear his voice. Look out, Skipper. <laughs> and you should have seen him pull out his lunch. He was like, oh, I wonder what the missus has got in my grub can today. So I'm uh, looking forward to questions and, uh, and having you guys help me refine my messaging. Maybe I'll develop a logic model. So if you have questions, you can unmute yeah. yourselves or you can uh, put it in the chat and we can read it. Okay. I'm, I'm share. I have a question. Yeah, John. Um, the way you got uh, kids to be interested in manatees was taking them out and showing them manatees and having them experience that thing, um, you know, personally. I'm wondering, for those of us that are potentially, you know, interacting with other people that have input into uh, policy and things like that, what kinds of, this is the question, what kinds of things have you seen that indicate real change in young people or immigrants um, from their experiences fishing with fishing for success? What changes have I seen? Um, yeah, so the WISH program, um, which I, I didn't bring up here, uh, one of our uh, partnerships with the Association for New Canadians is called WISH, which is Women Sharing Heritage. And that was recognized by the um, Canadian Association for Mental Health as a uh, promising practice. And it's a three month program every two weeks. Uh, our Girls Who Fish members volunteer and they um, share heritage um, with uh, young women uh, newcomers. And um, Susie Hagigi, who's the social worker who worked with me to develop the program, she said that the, um, the, the first cohort, of course, that was where she initially saw the big, big wow. Um, the women learned English faster. They um, didn't have to utilize the mental health services as much as previous cohorts. Um, they, um, that got jobs quicker. They uh, found Canadian friends and, um, and and didn't rely as much on their um, their own um, ethnic friends as much. And um, and so she she you know placed that um, at the doorstep of the of the Wish program. And um, and so we you know subsequently we've um, Susie and I have written about it and developed a webinar on it and uh, looking and, and, we, and we do this now every year. And so, um, so we do have some um, anecdotal um, evidence in that way. And um, yeah, does that help John? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, Kim. Uh, Kim, uh, I have a couple of, uh, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm assuming you're able to hear me. I don't know if you are. Okay, yeah, hi. Um, uh, Kim, my, my questions are around uh, gender in the fishing industry. Uh, you touched on the a very in, in interesting uh, section there. Um, and uh, could perhaps you share a bit more in terms of how that's being addressed, how it, I mean, we're aware that fewer than 2% of the enterprises in the fishing industry are owned or controlled by women. I forget what the stats are for participation, you know, as uh, on a vessel, but uh, women uh, over the centuries, their role has not been in the fishing industry, but now times have changed, thanks be to God. And it's not like the old days that the men to go fishing and women to stay home to the bread. All that stuff's gone now, um, hopefully. But it seems like uh, it seems like the industry is now controlled and all being divided up uh, amongst sources outside. So I'm wondering if perhaps women are even going to get a chance to do that, to be 
uh, co-participants in the industry and to benefit from it. Uh, and one final thing is you did refer uh, to uh, uh, DFO's insistence on using recreational fishery, uh, which is a, a demeaning term in itself. Uh, and you made a very good point is that uh, it was, uh, it's, uh, it's certainly not a term that would endear anybody uh, to, uh, you know, when in reality, it's a personal use food fishery is what it is. But DFO, for some reason, insists on uh, using that sort of derogatory term. Uh, and I'm wondering how we could expect your type of education program, which is so very important, which is really where it is, is ground zero. Um, how, how you can deal with that? Uh, I mean, these are, these are two things, regulatory problems that are keeping women out and it'll all be gone before they get in. And the other is an image problem at DFO itself, which demeans the small scale fishery in a way, because that's what small scale fishery is really what they're calling recreational, but it's, it's more personal use. Thank you. Yep. So the gender issue first. Um, yeah. So you're right with the numbers. So the just under 2% of fishing enterprises in Newfoundland and Labrador are owned by women and it, the number covers around 20 to 23 percent of um, professional fish harvesters registered professional fish harvesters are are women um, so how to change that um, there there are very real institutionalized barriers to women's participa participation in fishery and um, that's only going to change if we have targeted programming and real policies because um, the the space on the boat is very different from working in an office building or any other kind of traditional or not traditional any kind of workplace um, if you're on a if you're on a boat it, and it's a very male dominated profession, there's nowhere to go. Even if you are working inshore and you know you're only a few miles offshore and, and, and you're only out for the day, it there's still nowhere to go. You're just stuck on the boat. In fact, just a few years ago there was a corner brook captain who was convicted of trying to throw a crew member overboard. And this crew member also happened to be his girlfriend and um and she would have um, been killed except for other crew members heard her screaming and rescued her. And um, and the defense for the captain was just trying to say, oh, it was, well, it was just domestic. Um, it was just a domestic issue and uh, it shouldn't be viewed as <laughs> as a as a attempted homicide or, or, or it should be viewed as assault. So we need to have um, captains who are women. There needs to be um, not just equality, but equity kinds of programming developed that, that move women through and support them. That, that needs to happen so that change can occur. The other thing about the- uh, Kim, Kim if, I, if I may, before you leave that topic, are there any initiatives? I mean, your audience here today is Marine Institute related in this whole sector. But I haven't seen any initiatives at the Marine Institute or any other institute. No, I haven't seen it. To, to it. So uh, we're, how does this even happen if the Marine no, Institute? And I've attended the Marine Institute because I, I received a, a fishing master's score, um, you know, which uh, allows me uh, to serve as a fishing captain on a 65 foot vessel. And, um, and so I, you know, I took my courses at Marine Institute and usually I was the only woman in the class. Uh, there were, I, I didn't have any uh, uh, women serve as uh, instructors. And I did ask Marine Institute what they were doing to increase their number of women instructors or increase their number of women uh, at, attending the courses. And I was told that they invite women and so I asked what specifically they do to invite women. I, I didn't, didn't, I wasn't given any specific details. Um, I, um, 
You know, I I don't see that anything's being done. Um, so that's you know, so that that's all I can speak to as far as that goes. Um, you know, the, the, the thing is that I know from teaching that we, there needs to be role models. It, it's the same thing with any kind of curriculum or any kind of um, book that you present to a young person. They need to see people who look like them. In fact, um, one of the, if you go to Fishing for Success's YouTube channel, we have a, um, a short film that we produced a, a few years ago, um, one of our volunteers created for us and was submitted to the Women in Seafoods International Short Film Competition at one third place, which is really cool. And, um, and, and, and we just say that, you, you know, we have to, if young people are going to think about doing this as a career, they have to see people who look like them doing this. And, and um, so if we're going to talk about including women, if we're going to talk about including people of color, if we're going to talk about including um, indigenous people, LGBTQ, however we describe what we want um, our future fishery to look like, um, we have to target those people and that's what we need to do. So for example, when Fishing for Success started a Girls Who Fish program, because we recognized there was a gender issue, we look around and it's all white privileged women. Well, that wasn't our plan. <laughs> so, so then we, we, you know, we target people. We set out and we, um, we invite um, other uh, nonprofits who, um, whose members are um, the, the people that we want to work with. And, um, and we develop programs together. And, you know, and that's what you do because unfortunately the reality is that um, that the this the nature space has become um, a, a space of, of, of white and um, and uh, has become a space of uh, colonialism and and uh, imperialism and owned by corporations and capitalism and everything else. And so, if we're going to change that space, we have to make um, a deliberate effort to change it. We can't just invite them. So, and then the next um, question that you asked um, was about the recreational ground fish fishery. And we have to call it food fishery. We, we you know, we can't, um, we can't call it recreation. I, I can't teach a child that to kill an animal is a recreation. Um, I have to explain um, you know, to, the, to the child that we, you know, we are predators and we eat animals and we eat plants and, and we are killing them. And, and you know, we talk about the role of, of predators in the ecosystem and, and that they keep, and you know, and that's, that, you know, that's part of, of, the, of the learning process. And um, predators keep ecosystems healthy. We, we understand that uh, sharks are um, vital to the health of uh, coral ecosystems or the health of our oceans or the value that communities have to um, keeping down moose populations and then actually affecting um, the, the flora of, of um, you know, um, of the ecosystem too. It's, it's all connected. And um, so humans as predators play a valuable role in, in the whole ecosystem. So, um, and I, I really hope that when young people think about uh, the fact that they are predators within the system, they would um, consider the fact that they shouldn't waste the animal, that they should use 100% of the animal, or at least try to use 100% of the animal, and honor that animal by using as much of it as they can, and um, and share it and provide it as a gift to others and, um, and, and yeah, so that's, that's what we, we communicate to children, not that it's a recreation. And the other thing that I like to talk about too, is that when you think about your family budget, you know, when you're going through and, and we're all doing this now with COVID because money is so tight right now. I mean, you look at your budget and you're like, what are the first things that you try to, to knock off of your budget? It's those recreational things, right? And, um, and so fishing isn't a recreation. Fishing is necessary to, um, to your physical and mental well-being. I mean, you evolved 
um, humans evolved outside in nature um, and, and over millions of years and, and you need it. It's just part of who you are. Um, go outside and take a walk for five minutes and I'll guarantee you, you'll just feel like you got a $5,000 pay raise. You, you need nature. And, um, and calling it a recreation is, it's, um, it's wrong. So just leave uh, it. We, we have a few questions in the chat. Yes, please read the person. chat questions. So first one is uh, Monica Angel. Hi, Kim, great talk. A quick question. Are you currently assessing changes in kids' behavior, awareness, etc., through your activities? Um, no, we aren't, but that's the next step. Um, our, our first step was uh, a formative um, assessment, which is just evaluating how uh, we internally um, operate our programming and if it works for us. And then the next step is um, doing that um, assessment as far as um, how well it's um, working at that end. So that's the next step. Once we um, had all of that internal kind of uh, working down pat. So, so yes, thank you, Monica. That's, that's our next step. Next question is Lucia. Uh, hi, Kim. I felt identified when you talk about lack of female role models in fisheries management, because it's not easy for me to find female mentors. Do you have any advice to give women like me? Um, uh, well, I mean, that's one of the big reasons why we started Girls Who Fish, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we need somehow to search each other out and serve as a support to one another. And um, uh, that, and uh, yeah, search each other out and, and help each other because there, there's so much research to show that if we do search each other out and form our groups that we're more likely to succeed as we go through um, grad school or through our careers, that if you have your support system, you're more likely to succeed. So um, if you, if I've got, um, you've got my email here. So if you want to connect with me, um, yes. Yeah, if you want to connect with me and also, um, if you want to connect through social media, we can do that. And we're going to be reforming um, Girls Who Fish, and we can connect that way too. And uh, we definitely should look at some of the ways that we can form a, a better network of women. Um, I, I know that there's a, a women in um, marine industries and um, women in resource development um, also is one. And um, Maybe you can answer me, Rihanna, about um, is there, does marine science have a, a women in STEM or something similar there? Not at Marine Institute, I don't believe, no. So we may just have to start our own thing. <laughs> yes, and a, a comment on that, uh, a few months ago, I guess I was looking at inclusion in 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 fisheries like in fisheries science in, in like is that the part that i work and looking at the the researchers that like that have the most citations in the fishery science world if you look at the top 50 you see that uh, mostly are white men and there are only like in that list i could only find uh, two black persons and two females so it's like a, a really big spread pro problem in, in all the aspects of fisheries so the next question is um from jinji uh, excuse me if i pronounce name wrong so a big fan of Kimberly fishing for success, girls who fish, Betty Harbor, and Newfoundland from Japan. Thanks for the talk, Kim. My question is about the international collaborations. We have talked about a couple of times, but haven't really had time to have a real talk. Um, sister program, sister communities, how should we start this 
things with. I just want to hear uh, your thoughts so far, if you have any ideas in mind. I know we've got to get that started. Um, <laughs> I know sister cities and sisters, girls who fish, and um, I know that's exciting. Um, yeah, so we really do need to set a date. Yeah, yeah, I know, yes. <laughs> so what do you think? Well, we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I know she's, got, she, she's get, trying to get a commitment out of me here. <laughs> <laughs> so we definitely have to start. How? What does it look like there for um, COVID? Are, are are you coming out of it there? Or are you? It's still slow to. Uh, well, it's uh, we kind of had the the third wave, and it's but it's getting better a little bit now. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I I I I haven't really went to the. I mean, in the field for a long time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, I know outside yeah. is the safest place. So mm -hmm. um, how, how are outside activities? Are you, are you allowed to conduct outside activities? Yes, we're allowed. Yeah. Okay. So, allowed. yeah, yeah, so we're just going to have to set a date. Maybe we could yeah. get Rick Institute to work with us on it, too, and we could mm -hmm. do some kind of collaboration thing mm -hmm. okay yeah. all right I'm, I, every all right everybody's my witness here we're going to get this going <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right thanks and <laughs> less common i guess is uh, jenny is saying that there is a facebook group called a uh, woman for fisheries so it's called what you know a woman for fisheries so we can maybe check that out so I don't know if there is a, another question. Let's see. I'm trying to find the chat spot again. I lost it when I switched to sharing. Let me see. Okay, there it is. Women of fisheries. Okay. Let me see. There's a couple of things. Um, Girls Who Fish has a Facebook site, and Fishing for Success has a Facebook site, and of course, Twitter and Instagram. Um, a couple of things to keep an eye on. Um, DFO is launching this campaign. Let's see if I'll pick up the link for you. DFO is launching that campaign, so this is supposedly it'll be an opportunity for you to get um, some of your feedback in. I'm, I'm I'm very cautious about the wording on blue economy, um, ocean space, and how that is being worded. I, I don't want young people to be left out, women to be left out, small scale fisheries to be left out. And um, I don't want it to just be a corporate place to make money. That, that concerns me. So thank you very much, Kimberly, for that link and for commenting this uh, interesting discussion with your, your presentation. It was really good to have you here. And thank you, everyone, for joining our seminar. And stay tuned so we can, um, you can join us next uh, Wednesday for our seminars. So thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me.